Hi, welcome to the online TA review for week three's material. Today, we're going to be talking about DNA and RNA structure. It's my goal that through this review, you'll be able to draw a nucleotide with all of its parts, know the differences between different bases, as well as know the differences between RNA and DNA. Knowing the structure of one nucleotide, I also want you to be able to know what happens when we put multiple nucleotides together. Finally, I'll be talking about three classic experiments that helped us discover DNA as the genetic material of life. So to start us off, I've drawn a nucleotide and I've labeled the carbons. Though there are carbons in the base, we only worry about the carbons in the sugar. The one prime carbon has the base attached to it. Bases are what make one nucleotide different from another. Now the two prime carbon is what makes an RNA nucleotide different from a DNA nucleotide. RNA has an OH attached here. The D in DNA stands for deoxy, meaning we've lost the oxygen. So there is only a hydrogen here. The three prime carbon is where the next nucleotide is added. And finally, the five prime carbon, which sticks out of the ring, has a phosphate group attached to it. Nucleotides are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. I encourage you to know how to draw one. If you'd like to, pause the video and take a second to draw a nucleotide on your notes and teach yourself what is important about carbons 1, 2, 3, and 5. Now talking more about the bases, we have two categories, purines and pyrimidines. Purines are, like, are the bases G and A. Pyrimidines are the bases C and T. Purines have two rings while pyrimidines only have one. We want you to be able to recognize each one of the different bases. If we showed you a picture, you should be able to identify it. Also know that G's base pair with C's and do so with three hydrogen bonds. A's base pair with T's and U's with two hydrogen bonds. An easy way to remember which bases are the purines is with this sentence. General authorities are pure. So if you see a base with two rings, it's either G or A. On adenines, oxygen is absent. If it only has one ring, it's a C or T. Thymines have two oxygens. Because T's and A's are held together by two hydrogen bonds, it's easier to open DNA in areas that are T and A rich, like a tata box. Now let's talk about some of the differences in RNA and DNA. Let's start with what makes RNA unique. The two prime carbon of RNA has an OH. RNA has uracils instead of thymines. RNA is single-stranded and will readily base pair if it can. Because it's single-stranded, it can form elaborate shapes that actually look pretty cool. Also, RNA is less stable than DNA. DNA, on the other hand, has only a hydrogen at the two prime carbon. DNA has thymines instead of uracils. DNA is double-stranded with the two strands running in opposite directions. We call this anti-parallel. Because it is double-stranded, it also must follow Charkov's rules, which states that the concentration or number of A's must equal the number of T's, and the number of C's must equal the number of G's. Now let's talk about some of the bonds that hold DNA and RNA together. But first, a quick fact. One nucleotide is about 310 Daltons in mass. Remember how the one prime carbon has a base attached to it? That bond is called the glycosidic bond. This bond is sometimes cut spontaneously by hydrolysis, which means cutting by water. You'll also remember that the three prime carbon is where the next nucleotide is added. When it is added, the bond that is formed is a, is a phosphodiester bond. Because the new nucleotide is added to the three prime carbon, we say DNA and RNA has a directionality of five prime to three prime and is by convention written down in the same direction. By the way, can you tell if these nucleotides are DNTPs or NTPs? You'll see NTP a lot, which stands for nucleoside triphosphate. Nucleosides are what we call a sugar with a base attached to it. Triphosphate just refers to the three phosphates attached to the five prime end of a free nucleotide. Two of those phosphate groups provide the energy to make the phosphodiester bond. Phosphate groups have a negative charge, and because each nucleotide of the backbone of DNA has one, the overall charge of DNA is negative. Do you remember DDNTP? How is this different from a normal DNTP? Well, the two, D, D, the, well, the two Ds stand for dideoxy, meaning it's lost oxygen twice over. The three, carbon, the three prime carbon of DDNTP doesn't have an oxygen, which prevents it from being able to have a new nucleotide added onto it. 
Now, when one nucleotide is base paired with another, it doesn't make a bond of 180 degrees. Instead, it's close to 90 degrees due to the glycosidic bonds. When DNA is twisted in the double helix form, that bend creates two different grooves, a major and a minor groove. One turn of a DNA helix has about 10.5 base pairs in it and is about 0.34 nanometers in height. The DNA itself is about 2 nanometers wide. The significance of the major and minor grooves is that most proteins can't access the DNA from the minor groove. Instead, they only fit inside the major groove. Finally, I mentioned before that DNA is written in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Here's an example. I've written, only, I've written one sequence of DNA and I want you to take a second to write its complement. Assuming you've written the complement, what you've just written down is the template strand. If we don't give you the numbers, nor tell you what the strand is, assume that what you see is the sense strand and it is going in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Now I'd like to talk briefly about three classic experiments. I've included some hashtags that I want you to associate with these people and their experiments. The first is Griffith's experiment. He observed that R cells from a bacteria called pneumococcus didn't kill mice, while S cells did. Eventually, he discovered that if he combined dead S cells with living R cells, the R cells ended up killing the mice, leading him to reveal the fact that genetic material could be transferred from one organism to another. Avery's experiment helped us know that DNA is the genetic material and not proteins or RNA. He did so by repeating Griffith's experiment with a twist. He used a series of cascading steps, beginning by isolating the proteins, RNA, and DNA from from S cells. Then he added protease, which digests proteins, and saw if it killed the mice, which it did. Then he added ribonuclease, which digests RNA, and saw if it killed mice, and it did. Only when he added deoxyribonuclease, or DNase, were the mice able to survive, suggesting that DNA was the actual material that carried genetic information. Hershey and Chase confirmed this by using phages, which are viruses that attack bacteria. Viruses are made of a protein coat and DNA. By having two groups of viruses, one with their protein coats tagged with radioactive sulfur, and the other having their DNA tagged with radioactive phosphorus, he was able to track what was actually being injected into the bacteria. He saw that what was being passed on was the DNA.